Everybody, good morning again and welcome. Welcome to our church. Shabbat Shalom. I'm glad you guys are here. Um, I was actually talking to Robert this morning a little bit about some stuff, and it is uh, <clears throat> it's tough. It's tough being a human being anymore, isn't it? I mean, it just feels like we're being pounded on all sides, people in general. I think it's much tougher being a Christian and standing for what is right. I think that's hard. And, and oftentimes, I'll speak for me, I find myself beating myself up for my failures. I find myself criticizing, being self-critical um, because I can't get it all right all the time. I try to get it right and sometimes it just doesn't happen. I do what I think is the right thing and it just doesn't work out. I think I'm following God's lead and God's direction and everything goes south and I'm just trying to figure out what in the world is happening. And part of it is that I push too hard. Uh, some of it is that I pray but I don't listen for God's response. You ever do that? Pray a lot on my knees praying but then I don't take quiet reflective time and listen for God's still gentle voice to respond back to me. Sometimes it's just the way it is. We live in a fallen world, and we have to keep our, as we said last week, our eyes focused on the horizon. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus and not on us and not on other people, and we can be expected to maybe pull through this thing. So the sermon today is called Easy Does It, and part of that is about understanding this concept of taking care of ourselves in addition to taking care of those around us and the things that we have to do in order to prepare ourselves for the, for the soon coming of Jesus. We have a communion coming up in a couple weeks, and I think this applies to that also. We need to be prepared for this. We can't just walk into communion and think that, you know, um, we can just do this and walk away and it's not a big deal because communion is a big deal. We don't do it as often as we used to because I don't want it to be some rote thing that we just do. I want it to mean something and to be purposeful for us. My opening verse here is from 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. It says, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, <clears throat> excuse me, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what it should do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Is this talking purely about physical exercise? It's not, is it? It's talking about doing the things we need to do to be prepared to make it to heaven. It says that only one person wins the race. That doesn't mean only one of us is going to heaven, because the competition would be fierce. <laughs> I would have given up a long time ago, knowing people that I know that I think do such a better job at being a Christian than I do, for sure. But what it means is that each of us in our own person has to, has to work to win we have to do the things that God instructs us to do, to do the next right thing, but we have to find a way to do it so we don't overdo it and burn ourselves out. You know, Susan was talking about prayers for my sister-in-law, Vicki, taking care of my father-in-law. And as you know, I go up to New York several times a year to spend time with them and to help take care of them. And it's, it's a job, you know? When I, I imagine if I live to be that old, which I don't think I want to, but if I do, that my kids are going to have a bit of a challenge with them uh, taking care of Poppy here, you know? And, and I know that it was like that with my dad and my mom, who's still alive, that it's a challenge. And we can get so focused on them and their needs that we forget to take care of our own needs. We can get so obsessive compulsive in the things that we do that we forget where our eyes need to be focused, and that is on Jesus. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about this difference between temperance and moderation because a lot of people seem to think that they are the same. Moderation is the state in which something remains moderate <clears throat> rather than becoming extreme or excessive. I can be moderate in my conversation, I can be moderate in my dress, but you know what? I can be moderate in use of alcohol and drugs and, and 
other things that are not there. The Bible has Ten Commandments. We can't moderate those Ten Commandments. We can't say, well, I can steal a little bit, but not a lot. I can have a little bit of adultery, but not a lot of adultery. Or, or you know, I can kill if it's necessary, but, you know, not if it's not. It doesn't work that way. And so moderation is a dangerous thing for us as Christians. Instead, I wanted to talk about the idea of temperance. And temperance is a more active role. It's a more active role in controlling um, our behaviors and our actions when it comes to the use of potentially harmful activities or things such as drinking or alcohol or smoking or how we talk to other people or how we address things. Temperance encourages abstinence from these behaviors, but it avoids extremes in other ways. So I can be temperate in my dress, but, but not necessarily look like I'm from the 1600s. Okay? I can be temperate in my words, but not have to speak Old English still. I can be temperate in my eating, but it also means that I shouldn't be eating things that are bad for me or that are prohibited to eat in the Bible as well. So temperance is a more active role that we take pretty much as Christians. Now, it doesn't always include abstinence because it can't. Do we need to eat? We need to drink? We need to exercise. We need to be involved in relationships. <laughs> sometimes we go, no. We'd probably be better off sometimes if we weren't. But that's the way it is. We are involved in relationships. And we have to be temperate in the way that we address those things. My friend Henry used to say that it's about something called equanimity. It's a balance in our lives and the way that we do things. 2 Peter 1, 5 to 11 says, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with the generous provision of what? Moral excellence. And moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. I mean, isn't that great? That's a moderate way, that's a temperate way for us to, to address our relationship with other people and for us to move through this world. It goes on to say, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard but not so hard that you work yourself to death, that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You ever heard of uh, the King's Heralds, the singers? They have this song. Um, I, I haven't heard a lot of their stuff, but I... I remember when, I think they came to Clearwater once and they did a little concert there, or a camp meeting once, and they did a concert. And they had this song and it said, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. You ever heard that? Yeah. You ever heard that expression? Yeah. It means that we can be so obsessively focused on righteousness that we're no good to the people around us and helping them in the problems that they have. We're so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. We have to draw a balance somewhere. Relationships, I think, is the biggest place where we get taken out. I really do. We get into a situation where we become um, obsessive or obsessed in our relationships or codependent in our relationships with another person. We put all of our faith in that person. We put our salvation in that person's hands. And then when that person um, defies our trust, which it's gonna happen, any of you that have been in relationships or have been married, um, you know that there are times when that relationship goes south, when we feel like the trust has been violated. Because we are human beings and we are subject to human frailty. And the moment that we take our focus off of God and we put it on another person, we set ourselves up for failure. Temperance is not abstinence from relationships. It's having relationships and trusting other people, but putting our focus and our trust in who? In Jesus, because he's the only one who will never fail us, who will never let us down. 
You know, I have, how many have heard this expression? If I got my health, I got what? Everything. Everything. You ever hear that? What happens if something happens to your health? What do you have? Nothing? I mean, I've heard people say, as long as I got my kids, I got everything. And then we lose a child, what happens? We got nothing. Because we put our focus and our faith and our, and our trust there. I've heard people say, hey, you know, as long as I got my job, I got everything. And then we lose our job, and what do we have? So we have to keep our focus on Jesus. We have to be temperate in those things. It's okay to have a job and to work hard, but not so much that we don't have time for our families or for other people. You know, there's all these articles I've read written about pastors that are so focused on helping everyone in the congregation without delegating any of the workload or the authority that they end up burning out and going out, and some of them never come back, you know? And we can't be there. How about diet and exercise? Let's talk about that. Uh, Ms. White writes this in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3. In temperance and eating, even a food of the right quality will have a prostrating influence upon the system and will blunt the keener and holier emotions. There are so many studies out now um, that I've been reading about um, having a lower calorie intake. You know, they, they say, like, you can go and look it up. I can go and look up what my basal um, resting metabolic rate is. And for me, it doesn't work because my, my resting me metabolism, my resting metabolic rate is just a hair north of hibernation, actually. And so the amount of calories I need in a day are significantly less than maybe somebody else does. My son-in-law or my um, Oliver, my grandson, he probably burns 3,500 calories a day just sleeping, you know? And so he needs to eat like crazy. But what they're finding is that these calorie deficient diets where even a, two or 300 calories below what you may think you need adds a tremendous amount to our health, our mental capabilities, and to our longevity and the qualities of our life. It says strict temperance in eating and drinking is highly essential for the healthy preservation and vigorous exercise of all functions of the body. Strictly temperate habits combined with exercise of the muscles as well as of the mind will preserve both mental and physical vigor and give power of endurance to those engaged in the ministry, it says, to editors and to all those whose habits are sedentary. As a people, with all our profession of health reform, we eat too much. Now I hate myself for doing this on the day that we have a potluck. <laughs> I wanted to say that ahead of time because you'll probably hate me too. As a people, it says, with all our profession of health reform, we do what? We eat too much. Indulgence of appetite is the greatest cause of physical and mental debility and lies at the foundation of the feebleness which is apparent everywhere. I found out something about eating too much. I never had a clue how much I really depended on food and eating because I never considered myself much into food until I had that surgery in February and I've been on a feeding tube for four or five months almost. I was on a feeding tube and I could eat nothing except stuff I could get into the tube. And I was so hungry sometimes. And after a while, you know, it actually went away. And I realized, I didn't, I didn't realize how much I loved to eat, because I didn't think I did, until I couldn't do it anymore. And it really was an object lesson for me. And now I have not gone back to eating the way that I used to. I, well, part of it I can't, but I probably won't anyway, because I have never felt better than I did when I was on that feeding tube. It's not a good diet. I don't recommend it for anybody, you know? And I thank God I've gained some of that weight back now because I was getting to be starvation mode. But, but, you know, I don't think we realize it sometimes because we get so caught up into it. We need to exercise self-control. I want you to remember this, that it was at the banquet after King Ahasuerus stuffed himself with food that he wanted Queen Vashti to start doing those inappropriate dance moves, right? That's when that happened. And if you remember, how did, how did Esther um, um, get the king to do what she wanted him to do? She stuffed him full of food first. Food is a drug, guys. And if we overeat, it is such a violent abuse to the human body. 
and we become drugged from it. And, and we, we are no longer able to focus as clearly as we did before. And I guess, I guess Esther knew that. And she stuffed him with food and drink. And then she asked him for the favor. And she got everything she wanted out of him. You know? They say the way to a man's heart is what? <laughs> now, I, I learned that out. I learned that because with the stomach tube, actually, that was the way to my stomach, was right through my stomach. But it's not the way to our hearts. The way to a man's heart should be what? His love of Jesus. That should be the way to a man's heart, not food. Proverbs 23, 1 to 3 says, While dining with a ruler, pay attention to what is put before you. If you are a big eater, do what? Put a knife to your throat, it says. Don't desire all the delicacies, for he might be trying to trick you. That's what happened with Vashti, wasn't it? That's what happened with Esther. That's exactly right. How about excessive exercise? Should we be exercising? Yes, we should exercise all the time. I walk a lot because I can't do much more. But, you know, I was averaging around 20,000 steps a day. It was too much. I'm back down a little bit to 15. Even that sometimes feels like a lot, you know. We should be exercising. But if we exercise too much. So, so here's the thing. Exercise temperately builds our immune system. You want to be resistant from all these diseases out there? If you eat properly and you exercise temperately, your immune system will be at its peak function. But if you don't exercise enough, what happens to the immune system? It goes down. What if you don't eat properly? Yeah. You know, one tablespoon of sugar, which is about what there is in half the drinks that people tend to drink, one tablespoon of sugar can shut down the immune system, can cause it to drop by 70% for up to five hours. You want to not get COVID? Cut all added sugar out of your life right now until we can get through this thing because sugar um, kills your immune system. And unfortunately, so does excessive exercise. In a study published in the August 1995 issue of Medicine and Sciences and Sports and Exercise, Dr. J. Duncan McDougall and colleagues investigated the effects of training on the immune system of distance runners. I used to run marathons. I used to love it. But I would always get sick afterwards because I would train too hard and I would burn myself out at those marathons. The runners' immune systems were depressed more by increasing the intensity than by increasing the volume. Two percent of the volume runners got sick during the post-marathon week. Thirteen percent of those who trained at high intensity got sick. Doesn't mean you can't run a marathon. You just can't run one every week. And you can't run it in four hours or three hours if you want to be, um, if you want to stay healthy. How about in our daily lives? Let me ask you something. <clears throat> Is a little bit of adultery okay? <laughs> just a little bit? No? How about just a little bit of stealing? What if I go into Walmart, they got tons of money, and I, I just take an inexpensive item. Is that okay? How are we going to witness to the holiness of Christ if we're not holy ourselves? <clears throat> if we don't abide by the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> how do we witness to other people about the importance of it? It's not about perfection. It's about progress in our lives. It's about committing each day that we wake up and we hit our knees and we ask God to guide us in the way that we conduct ourselves today. It's okay. Um, uh, Self-control is part of the fruit of the Spirit. But you know what I like to do? I, I, I saw this car and it had a bumper sticker. It said, Jesus is my co-pilot. That's terrible. Because if he's my co-pilot, he's in a world of hurt. Jesus is my pilot. And if I'm blessed enough, I'll be his co-pilot. I'd rather have him driving in the car down 19 than me. I'd be more comfortable in the passenger seat if Jesus was driving than Jesus would be in the passenger seat if I was driving. I can promise you that. I need to make sure that m when I make my decisions, Here's what I try to do when it comes time to make a decision or to do something. I try to picture that Jesus is right there with me. Would he approve of what I'm about to say, what I'm about to do, what I'm about to eat? 
If Jesus is here with me right now, will he approve of the words that are coming out of my mouth right now? And if not, then I need to rethink what I'm going to say. Would he approve of the action that I'm about to take? And if he wouldn't, then I need to rethink that action. Because if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be enveloped, as Yolanda talked about, in the full armor of God, I need to respect the fact that the law was put there for my benefit. And I need to, I need to practice being holy in my daily life. Romans 13, 13 and 14 says, this is all the more urgent for you know how late it is. What does it mean? Is it what's it, 11.30 at night? What does it mean how late it is? Time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Uh, so this is written a few thousand, a couple thousand years ago. I know that. But it's still nearer now than it was. In fact, do you believe that someday Jesus is going to return? then right now is nearer to that return than it was when I said it the first time 30 seconds ago. We have to keep that perspective in mind. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining what? Armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge in your evil desires. How about being temperate in relationships? Ah, ouch. I think that's the hardest one. I think that relationships take people out more than anything else. I think people end up relapsing with drugs and alcohol, going away from the church due to relationships more than anything else because we feel like we got burned or we got hurt by someone. Well, that's because we put too much of our focus on that person. I'm not saying that we lose someone or a relationship breaks up, it doesn't hurt. I got that. We've all been there. But what I'm saying is that we survive it because we have our focus first on Jesus, on the righteousness of the kingdom of heaven, and then everything else will follow. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, well, actually through 10, says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay away. Didn't we just read this? Sorry. Well, I'm not going to read it again. That's actually from the law text is it? I think yeah. it is. Because it's actually from Second uh, Thessalonians. It is. Three. All right. You probably weren't temperate. So you're I wasn't temperate in putting my sermon together. <laughs> Tim speaks next week, and I will be sure to be here <laughs> to heckle and harass him. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I was intemperate in my preparation of my sermon. I need to give it more time. Actually, from now on, I'm going to run it by Tim. Well, let me read this from Miss White, because this is the right place. We sustain a most solemn relation one to another. Our influence is always either for or against the salvation of souls. We are either gathering with Christ or scattering abroad. We should walk humbly and make straight paths, lest we turn others out of the right way. <clears throat> let us not allow other people to turn us, and let us not turn other people. How about in our own behavior? So here's the thing. I believe that we judge any group of people by their least favorable members. Do you remember when Katrina came through Louisiana? And what is the news, what are the news media, what do they do when they go out to interview people? Are they looking for people who are articulate and can express their feelings in a reasonable and, and well understood way? Or do they look for people that can't? They want to sensationalize it. So they go find people who are not able to articulate themselves very well. And people look at that and go, man, that's how everybody in Louisiana must be. That's what the press does. 
The media goes out and they find whether it's, it's African Americans, it's um, Latinos, um, whether it's Jews, it doesn't matter. They pick the least favorable of those folks because they want to sensationalize it, and then we tend to judge everybody by those least favorable members. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Don't be the least favorable Christian. Don't pray at the table and then go off on your kids or your family or the waitress or the waiter and be abusive, because I have seen that happen. <clears throat> and I think, wow, is that what Christians are like? Don't be the least favorable Seventh-day Adventist. In fact, here's what I would encourage you to do. Don't let anyone know you're a Christian, and don't let them know you're an Adventist unless you're able to behave that way. Because you may be the first view of Jesus that they get. Don't, don't misrepresent our Savior. Just say nothing, and that would be better. As a Christian, we have an obligation to behave in such a way that we display our relationship with God as positive, that people see Jesus through us. Titus 1, 7 to 9 says, a church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent or dishonest with money. It's a big order, but there you have it. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home. And he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it they were wrong. Who's the leaders of our church? I mean, it's not just me. It's not just the elders or the deacons. Any one of us who goes out and represents ourselves as an Adventist becomes a leader in the, in the church and holds ourselves out to be a Christian, becomes a leader in the church. Ms. White writes, remember that the exercise of faith is the one means of preserving it. Should you sit always in one position without moving, your muscles would become strengthless and your limbs would lose the power of motion. You ever have your foot fall asleep because you sit too long in one spot? You go to stand up? That's embarrassing. The same is true in regard to your religious experience. You must have faith in the promise of God, in the promises of God. Faith will perfect itself in exercise, and that's exercise of faith, by the way, and activity, which is the activities that we perform practicing our faith. Remember what our primary purpose is. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 1 to 4 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this how? By keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the horizon. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not given your lives in your struggle against sin. If you're a parent and you oftentimes or sometimes have strong resentments towards the way your children treat you and behave, think about our Father God and the way we disappoint him. And let us act with the same grace and love towards our children that he does towards us, even in those times of grave disappointment. In closing, what's that abbreviation, team? Tim, is that the... Medical missionary? Is this medical missionary? Because this is a letter, letter 20, 1892, but it's been memorialized in this uh, edition, this document. Anyway, it says, we may never know until the judgment, the influence of a kind, considerate course of action to the inconsistent, the unreasonable, and the unworthy. Do you hear that? Person cuts you off and you wave. It's okay, don't worry about it. Instead of chasing them down and honking at them. I, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you this quick story. 
if, if you're going east on County Line Road, like from Shady Hills where we live, you can get onto 589 to go north on the toll road. And the way you do it is you go underneath the bridge and you go a little left and there's a light there and you stop and eventually the light turns green and you get on to 589. But that light has a sensor. And if your vehicle isn't parked up to the line, it doesn't trip the sensor. And I've been there before through three and four and five light cycles. So I was trying to get somewhere before they closed and I pulled up behind what appeared to be a lady in the vehicle, there was somebody else I couldn't tell, and they were like 15, 20 feet back from the line, and I waited one light cycle and another light cycle. And so I gave just a little tap, beep, beep. You know, it wasn't like an angry honk. It was a beep, beep. You know, hey, and, and, uh, and that didn't do any good, and the third light cycle came through. So I got out of my car, and I walked over, and I stayed way away from the window, because I know people are all freaked out nowadays. And I said, hello, and I was smiling, hello, and she rolled down her window. I said, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but this light uses a sensor, and if you don't pull up to the line, the light won't turn green, and we won't be able to go. And she's starting to say, okay, well, thank you. And the man in the seat next to her flipped out on me, started screaming at me, threatening to kill me. If I didn't get away from the window now, and I was like, whoa, you know, he was like flipping me off and swearing at me, and she's going, it's okay, honey, it's okay, he's just trying to help us out, you know? I mean, I have no idea what set that person off, but I apologized. I said, hey, man, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to do that, but I could have gone back off on that person, <laughs> right? I mean, have we not done that in the past? But who knows what that apology might do in the future to that person's thought about what, who we are as human beings. It says, after a, a course of provocation and injustice on their part, you treat them as you would an innocent person. You even take pains to show them special acts of kindness. Then you have acted the part of a Christian. It's easy to love those who love us. It's harder to love those who abuse us. But in fact, that's what we are commanded to do. And they become surprised and ashamed and see their course of action and meanness more clearly than if you plainly stated their aggravated acts to rebuke them. Temperance. It means that when things are going south and other people start to act up, we don't have to do that. And if somebody comes at us for some reason, we can be the ones to apologize. Whether we're right or not, it doesn't matter. Oftentimes, an apology is a sign of humility for us, and it will, it will de-escalate a situation so that, 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 we're not, that we are able to be the witness that God intends us to be. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm approaching my limit, so I'm going to stop. Doris? You are welcome to join us.